There were once five convicts who were transported to Van Diemen's land. Richard Hutchison was a Lancashire labourer who, at the age of 25, was sentenced to death for stealing a horse. Fortunately for him, this sentence was downgraded to life transportation and he was sent to Van Diemen's Land in 1811. In 1817, Richard married Bridget Byrne, a fellow convict from Ireland, and together they had five children. By 1818, Richard had his ticket of leave and for the next 11 years he lived a fairly uneventful life with his family in Hobart. Then in 1829, he was found guilty of stealing a bullock. As he was a lifer, this new offence lost him any and all freedoms that he'd earned, and he was transported to the dreaded Macquarie Harbour Penal Station for seven years to serve out his time on Sarah Island. He was described as five foot eight, with brown hair, grey eyes, and a small scar on his chin. In 1830, he was 44 years old. A native of Donegal, Ireland, William Coventry was about 26 when he was transported for seven years for an unspecified crime. He arrived in Sydney in 1802 and, like many others of that period, was sent for a time to Norfolk Island. After his sentence was up, he departed Norfolk in 1808 and travelled as a freeman to Van Diemen's Land, where in 1813 he received 52 acres of stolen land near a man called Stephen Melville. He and Melville's daughter, Mary Ann, cohabited and they had four children together, though it appears that they never married. They lived on this farm for six years, but eventually the place had to be sold as a way of liquidating debts. William appears in the law records again in 1816, found guilty of harbouring a fugitive convict, Thomas Kelly, who'd escaped a chain gang, and for this William was fined 40 shillings. Then in 1829, when he was 51 years old, an aged man by colonial standards, William was tried along with several others and found guilty of stealing three bullocks. For this, William Coventry was sentenced to seven years at the Macquarie Harbour Penal Station to serve out his time on Sarah Island. He was described as five foot three, with brown eyes and brown to grey hair, and in 1830, he was 52. Like Richard Hutchison, Patrick Fegan was also from Lancashire because sometimes you travel all across the world just to meet someone who grew up just down the road, though Patrick was significantly younger than Richard. He was only 14 when he was sentenced to seven years transportation for housebreaking and stealing silver spoons, arriving in Sydney in 1827. He was only in the town for 10 months working in the chain gangs before a series of re-offences including housebreaking and gambling led him to being transported to Van Diemen's land. Despite the brutal treatment afforded to repeat offenders, his behaviour did not improve and the teenage vegan often saw the end of the lash. He received 25 lashes in March 1828 for being idle and a further 50 in May for stealing from William Biggins before being removed to Macquarie Harbour Penal Settlement to serve out the rest of his time on Sarah Island. The cycle of offence and punishment continued. A week after he arrived, he received 25 lashes for faking sickness, then another 25 for throwing a stone at James Hawley and wounding him. For almost two years, Fegan seemed to lay low. Then in 1830, he broke into the Sora's hut and stole some food, for which he was sentenced to 12 days solitary confinement on bread and water. Though he was still only a child, mostly, Patrick Fegan was a hardened man when William and Richard arrived. He was four foot eleven, with light brown hair and a pox-marked complexion. And in 1830, he was only 17 years old. It's not certain what Matthew McElboy was transported for, or even if he was truly called McElboy, as there are numerous accounts where he was referred to as McAvoy. What we do know is that he was Irish, and he was transported in 1820 on the ship, the Castle Forbes, to serve a seven-year sentence. McElboy did not take to prison life and frequently appeared on the records receiving lashings for such seemingly minor issues as disrespectful behaviour and violent language. On one occasion, he received 50 lashes for quitting his master's residence without leave and taking his master's dogs out on a Sunday to go kangaroo hunting. But the final straw came in 1829 when Matthew was caught stealing, wearing apparel, and he was sentenced to serve another seven years out on Macquarie Harbour to be stationed on Sarah Island. He was described as five foot five and a half inches, had a fair, ruddy complexion, freckles, sandy hair, and hazel eyes 
and in 1830 he was 32 years old. In 1824, Edward Broughton, a native of Surrey, England, was 21 when he was convicted of housebreaking and sentenced to 14 years transportation. This was just the last in a long line of crimes that Edward had been accumulating since he'd run away from his parents' home at the age of 11, regularly appearing in the criminal records first as a pickpocketer, then later as a highwayman. After languishing on the prison hulks, Edward finally arrived in Van Diemen's Land in 1826 and was only in the colony for a grand total of 10 days before he continued his life of petty crime. Many of his offences were minor and easily overlooked, but as they grew, any leniency from the magistrates shrunk. So in 1827, when he was convicted of stealing a blanket from a fellow convict, Edward was retransported to Macquarie Harbour to serve out his time on Sarah Island. He was described very thoroughly as five foot four, with dark brown hair, brown eyes, a deep dimple on his chin, a small scar above his right eyebrow, and another scar along the right side of his nose. He also had the initials E, B, and H tattooed on the inside of his right arm. In 1830, he was 27 years old. And in 1830, all these five men were serving their time on Sarah Island in the Macquarie Harbour Penal Station. Founded in 1822, Sarah Island was located inside of Macquarie Harbour on the west coast of Van Diemen's Land and was a place of extremes. Extreme weather, extreme isolation and extreme brutality. The Roaring Forties that rushed up from the Antarctic made moving in and out of the harbour particularly treacherous, leading to the narrow entrance earning the name of Hell's Gate, both as a nod to the dangerous waters as well as to what was awaiting the convicts once they survived the trip inside, as it truly was a hell. Conditions there were said to be some of the harshest in all the penal settlements, its cruelty equaling and surpassing other such places of notoriety such as Toon Gabby and Port Arthur, which would take over operations once Sarah Island was shut down. The tiny island was immediately cleared of all vegetation to make way for various housing, but that turned out to be somewhat of a mistake as without natural cover, the fledgling settlement was exposed to the unforgiving winds of the Roaring Forties. To offset this, a wall had to be built to provide a windbreak. It was horribly overcrowded, with some convicts not even able to lay flat on their backs when they were herded into their communal barracks at the end of the day, and sanitation was little more than a faint memory. To make matters worse, Sarah Island was too small and its soil of too poor a quality to allow the settlement to become self-sufficient, so every piece of food had to be shipped in. This food was heavily salted and preserved, anything fresh just a dream, and soon dysentery, scurvy and malnutrition became rampant amongst the convicts who, in addition to a shockingly poor diet, were also expected to work in gruelling conditions. Establishing penal colonies was always an expensive business. Any such endeavours were expected to justify themselves by providing some sort of capital to the empire, and in the case of Sarah Island, this came in the form of the human pine. Lagarostrobus franklini is the only species of its genus found only on the southwest coast of Tasmania, and it is estimated to be some of the oldest living organisms on Earth. While an individual tree can live up to 3,000 years, a stand of trees discovered in 1955 was found to be over 10,500 years old. Unfortunately, it became extremely highly prized when it was found that the wood, deep gold in colour and finely grained, was also basically resistant to rot, making it perfect for building boats. So naturally this discovery sent the British shipbuilders into a frenzy and for a short period of time Sarah Island became the biggest shipbuilding place in Australia with convict labour providing the manpower to fill these ancient trees. Convicts would work terribly long hours, sometimes in shackles, sometimes neck deep in freezing waters, logging and preparing the trees to be shipped further downriver. And as with anywhere with awful conditions, the way to keep order and control over these prisoners was through strict discipline. Floggings were frequently and brutally administrated, with over 9,000 lashes given out in 1823 alone. 
Convicts were often selected to be the flagellators themselves, and if it was found that they shirked in their duties and weren't as cruel as possible with the cat, they themselves would be punished with a flogging. It was not at all uncommon for men to die from the lashings alone. It was said that convicts would purposely commit further crimes while at Sarah Island in the hope that an execution might be their salvation from the horrors that they had to endure. Therefore, it should be no surprise that many men did their best to escape. Between 1822 and 1828, a recorded 150 men attempted to make a break for it, with many being recaptured and over half dying or being presumed dead, as a lot of men were simply never seen again. The bushland was thick, mountainous and almost impenetrable, which made travel by land extremely hard, and while there were multiple attempts to capture a boat and escape via sea, some of them being actually quite successful, such as the Frederick Escape, a tale all of its own, and the escape of Matthew Brady, who would go on to become one of Tasmania's most famous bushrangers, this was still a very dangerous option. Regardless, there were still many successful escapes, though your definition of successful may need to be stretched a little. Because perhaps the most infamous of all these escapes is that of Alexandra Pierce in 1824, who with seven other men set off walking east in the hopes of finding civilization. Only Pierce survived that terrible journey by cannibalizing his fellow convicts. Something he freely confessed to when later recaptured, but his tale was so shocking that he was simply not believed and instead sent right back to Sarah Island, where he again escaped and again cannibalised another convict, a teenager named John Cox. By the time Richard Hutchinson, William Coventry, Patrick Fagan, Matthew McElboy and Edward Broughton had arrived, this visceral tale that begged belief had been splashed all about in a sensationalist media talked about ceaselessly in pubs and churches and penal settlements for years, and was probably a contributing factor to a decline in escapes from Sarah Island in the latter half of its operations. So the five of them would have definitely known what risks that they were taking when they too tried to flee that little slice of hell on earth on the 3rd of September, 1830. A little over 30 days later, only McElboy and Broughton walked out of the bush. On November the 27th, it was announced that McElboy and Broughton had been recaptured. The Hobart Town Courier reported, quote, Five men lately absconded from Macquarie Harbour, two of whom only succeeded in arriving in the settled districts after a journey of 18 days through the bush. They state that two of their companions, Richard Hutchinson, well known in the colony by the name Up and Down Dick, and the other Thomas Coventry, formerly proprietor of a little farm at the foot of Dromedary, known as Coventry's Point, were left behind after being with them for six days as they could not swim across a river, and that the remaining three, Edward Broughton, Matthew McAvoy, and a man named Fagan, continued their route until within about four days before the survivors were taken, when Fagan who was very much exhausted, being unable to run away from a tribe of natives whom they fell in with, was killed by them. These men have been closely examined in the jail by Mr Mulgrave, the chief police magistrate, respecting the fate of their comrades, about which much mystery hangs. End quote. On the 2nd of July 1831, they both pled guilty to being illegally at large while under the sentence of transportation. They weren't the only men in the dock that day up against such a charge, as four other men were found guilty of the same offence, and all six men were quickly sentenced to death. Then on the 5th of August 1831, in Hobart Town, just as McElboy and Broughton were about to embark on a short drop and a sudden stop, proceedings were paused for a moment as a missive from Broughton was read aloud. It had been written up by a witness by the name of John Bidsey and was so shocking and gruesome in its details that it was then printed in the Hobart Town Courier and later republished all across the colonies. In fact, the Sydney Gazette's version included a warning to readers beforehand, stated in parentheses, quote, Those of our readers whose feelings are unequal to the pursuit of the horrible had better pass over the ensuing paragraphs, end quote showing that trigger warnings have been around for a lot longer than some people might think. But now, 
Let's get to the meat of things and hear out Edward Broughton's confession. Quote, the awful confession and execution of Edward Broughton and Matthew McAvoy, who were executed at Hobart Town, Van Diemen's Land, for the willful murder of three of their fellow transports and eating them as food. On Friday last, Edward Broughton and Matthew McAvoy, who were convicted of absconding from the penal settlement of Macquarie Harbour, were executed. Whilst the executioner was pinioning his arms and adjusting the rope of the unfortunate Broughton, the following statement was read at his expressed desire as a full confession of his awful crime. Broughton said that he was now 28 years of age and had been sentenced to death for robbing in England under aggravated circumstances at the early age of 18. He had more than once endeavoured to rob his own mother and his horrible conduct was the means of breaking his father's heart and hurrying him to the grave. He was confined two years in Guildford Jail and had altogether spent more years in jail than at Liberty. On transportation to this colony, he had scarcely landed in Hobart Town when he commenced robberies. He was at last apprehended for an outrage which he committed at Sandy Bay, tried and transported to Macquarie Harbour. We have already stated that the party of runaways from Macquarie Harbour, of which Broughton was one, consisted originally of five men. Richard Hutchinson, commonly called Up and Down Dick, a tall man who had at one time a large flock of sheep and a herd of cattle at Barkhart Plains. Of an old man named Coventry, about 60 years of age. Patrick Fagan, a boy of a most depraved character, about 18 years old. And the two malefactors, Broughton and McAvoy, who suffered on the gallows on Friday. These men happened to be at one of the outstations at Macquarie Harbour and were in the charge of one man, a constable. This constable, Broughton declared, had shown him many personal kindnesses and refused him nothing in his power. Nevertheless, on their departure, he joined with his four fellow companions in robbing him of every article he had, not leaving him even a loaf of bread to subsist on, though he was without a morsel and three days must have elapsed before he could obtain any more from the settlement. And Broughton had besides at various times tried to be an accessory to his death by letting a tree fall upon him without giving him notice, or by other means for no other earthly reason than because he was a constable, and the unwilling or passive instrument of flogging the men, and Broughton therefore hated him. One would have thought that these five men, thus embarked on a most perilous journey, would have been knit together in one interest for their mutual safety and protection, but the very contrary was the case, as the sequel proved. They viewed each other with the most murderous feeling, jealous of the possession of the only axe which they carried amongst them, lest one should drive it into the head of the other, for that was their mode of slaughter upon one another whilst the wretched victim was asleep. The demon of evil had possession and walked in the midst of them. Every principle, every feeling of humanity was dead amongst them. Broughton called himself a Protestant and McAvoy a Roman Catholic, that is, they had sprung from parents professing these persuasions, but as for themselves, they had neither of them the least spark of religion. They knew no more what it was than the earth on which they trod. As soon as the provisions which they had contrived to carry with them were exhausted, the other four agreed amongst themselves to kill Hutchinson and to eat his body for support, and they drew lots among them who should be the one to drive the fatal axe into his head. The lot fell to Broughton, who carried it into execution. They cut the body in pieces and carried it with them, with the exception of the hands, feet, head and intestines. They ate heartily of it as Broughton expressed it. It lasted them some days, and when it was all consumed, a general alarm seized the whole party, lest one should kill the other. A great jealousy prevailed about carrying the axe, and scarce one amongst them dared shut his eyes or doze for a moment for fear of being sacrificed unawares. Under these dreadful circumstances, Broughton and Fagan made a sort of agreement between them that while one slept, the other should watch alternatively. We were always alarmed, said Broughton, and McAvoy's statement was of the same tenor. The next to be murdered was Coventry, the old man. He was cut in wood one night, and we agreed in the meantime to kill him. 
McAvoy and Fagan wanted to draw lots again, who should kill him, but I said no. I had already killed my men, and they ought to do it between them, that they might be in the same trouble as me. Fagan struck him the first blow. He saw him coming and cried out for mercy. He struck him on the head, just above the eye, but that did not kill him. Myself and McAvoy finished him and cut him to pieces. We ate greedily of the flesh, never sparing it, just as if we expected to meet a whole bullock the next day. I used to carry the axe by day and lay with it under my head at night, forgetting that they had knives and razors, I thought that I was safe. Before we had eaten all Coventry's flesh, McAvoy one night started up, looking horribly, and bid me to come with him and set some snares to try and catch a kangaroo. We left Fagan by the fire, and when we had gone about three hundred yards, he asked me to sit down. I had the axe upon my shoulder, and I was afraid he wanted to kill me, for he was stronger than me. So I threw the axe aside, but further from him than me, for fear that he should try to snatch it, and that I might try to reach it before him if he did. But he, wanted me, but he wanted me to kill Fagin, and that he might not be evidenced against. But he wanted me to kill Fagin, that he might not be evidence against us. I would not agree to it, saying that I could trust my life in his hands, and we returned to the fire. On our return to the fire, Fagin was laying by it, warming himself. I threw the axe down. He looked up and said, "Have you put any snares down, Ned?" I said, no, there are snares enough if you did not but know it. I sat beside him. McAvoy was beyond me. He was on my right and Fagin on my left. I wished to tell Fagin what had passed, but could not, as McAvoy was sitting with the axe close by, looking at us. I lay down and was in a doze when I heard Fagin scream out. I leapt to my feet in a dreadful fright and saw Fagin lying on his back with a dreadful cut in his head and the blood pouring from it. McAvoy was standing over him with an axe in his hand. I said, you murdering rascal, you bloody dog, what have you done? He said, this will save our lives, and struck him another blow on the head with the axe. Fagin only groaned after the scream. McAvoy then cut his throat with a razor through the windpipe. We stripped off his clothes and cut the body in pieces and roasted it. We had roasted all at once upon all occasions as it was lighter to carry and would keep longer and would not be so easily discovered. About four days after that we gave ourselves up at Macquarie's March, a hut belonging to Mr Nicholas at the junction of the Shannon and the Oust or the Big River. Two days before we had heard some dogs that had caught a kangaroo. They were wild dogs. We saw nobody. We got the kangaroo and threw away the remainder of Fagin's body. I wish this to be made public after my death. Edward Broughton. Witness. John Bisty. End quote. And the editor of the Sydney Gazette had this bit to add at the end. Quote, Such is this most horrible narrative that which we could believe nothing more dreadful in either fact or fiction has ever before been related. It was confirmed in every particular by a parallel statement made to the Reverend Mr. Colony by McElboy, wholly unknown to the other till the moment before they were launched into eternity. As it is, we confess we feel a sort of painful satisfaction that such irreclaimable monsters are swept from the earth, however much these wretched beings were otherwise to be pitied, for it is evident the miserable men had not a spark of human happiness for many years." End quote. Alexandra Pierce is a looming, infamous figure in Tasmanian history. There have been multiple movies, songs and podcasts made about him and the party of convicts that escaped to a freedom that was just as cruel as their prison. But the story of a secondary group of convicts who experienced almost exactly the same thing six years later has flown under the cultural radar. Perhaps the story simply doesn't flow as well as the original, as in this end there were two deeply remorseful men who seemed at peace with their execution, very unlike Pierce's last-minute crowing at the gallows about how delicious human flesh is. Perhaps the people of Van Diemen's Land were numbed at this point by the daily atrocities that one more was just lost in the ether. 
Perhaps modern-day Tasmanians only want to be remembered for one cannibalistic convict party. Whatever the reason, this awful confession has long since faded from public memory. There were once five convicts who were transported to Van Diemen's Land, then Sarah Island, who then attempted to escape. And one of them was only 17. <laughs>